examining characteristic of the Vietnamese liberation movement was the unrivaled authority over it, which the Communist Party exercised from 1930 until the success finally was to come to its movement some 45 years later. For some 45 years, the dominant influence in that liberation movement in Vietnam, beyond any question, was the Vietnamese Communist Movement. Uh, so that that struggle for liberation in Vietnam would, in a sense, be not only anti-imperialist, but it would also be anti-capitalist. Uh, so that the goal of that particular movement would be not only the restoration of the independence of the country of Vietnam, but it would also be the building of socialism in that country. What we're saying in the first instance is that those anti-communist or non-communist nationalist groups and parties prove to be, in Vietnam, perfectly incapable of rallying the masses for some kind of a movement against foreign imperialism. What we're saying in the second place was that the Vietnamese Communist Party, at least from the late 1930s on, until its success in the mid-1970s, that that Vietnamese Communist Party was able to anchor its strategy in the national aspirations of the Vietnamese people. So that you're dealing with that very curious and very fascinating phenomenon in Vietnam in which patriotism and communism become over a series of decades almost synonymous. And that point I would take it to be very critical because it means that Vietnam would not go the way of certain other third world countries in which the bourgeoisie was strong enough to mount a moderate nationalist movement against foreign imperialism. So moderate in its social vision, as a matter of fact, that it barely threatened the social structure of the society, that it barely threatened the unequal property arrangements of the society. Uh, we're thinking of a country like India, for example, uh, where the Indian Congress Party was quite capable of mobilizing the Indian masses in order to drive out British imperialism only after independence to deliver those masses into the hands of an indigenous bourgeoisie and in the second place that Vietnam as a result did not go the way of those independence movements such as the Egyptian or the Algerian in which populism, whether you call it by the name of Nasserism or whether you call it by the name of the ideology of the Algerian Liberation Front, really mystified the class struggle and after independence turned the state over to a very ambitious petty bourgeois bureaucracy. In Vietnam, it was not that way. In Vietnam, it went differently. And all you have to do, you see, is to cast your eye over some 45 years of history. From 1930, when that Vietnamese Communist Party was founded, down until almost our own day, and you see that at every critical moment, the Vietnamese Communist Party was present, mobilizing the mass, directing it, animating it, guiding it. In those 1930s, for example, when the face of French imperialism was uglier than it had ever been. In the early 1940s, when Japanese imperialism almost completely satellized Vietnam once and for all. In those critical years uh, between 1946 and 54, uh, those eight years when the French uh, government threw against the Vietnamese Revolution a massive army in order to destroy it. And finally, in those almost two decades after 1954, when American imperialism, of course, really visited upon the Vietnamese people a veritable technological holocaust against a people who would not yield. And at all times, that Vietnamese Communist Party, and I emphasize it because it is so critical in our understanding of the revolutionary process in general, that party was present, refusing to be defeated, picking itself up after every hammer blow, and all the time what was critical, planting its influence ever more deeply in the villages of Vietnam.
Now, I don't mean to imply by that that in the four or five decades before the Vietnamese Communist Party was founded in January of 1930, that the history of that country is void of resistance against French imperialism. But the point is that even a cursory review of those early instances of resistance really buttresses the premise upon which I am operating, that all of those earlier experiences prove incapable of mobilizing the mass to that point that an armed struggle against imperialism was possible. Now we have noted that the roots of that resistance dig all the way back to the 1880s and the 1890s, to that very first time when the French were conquering Vietnam and were pacifying the country. And I don't mean to underestimate the importance of that early resistance, which came to nourish the collective memory of the Vietnamese people and to give them the idea that they could and they should resist. But what I say about that early resistance is that it was led by mandarins, in other words, by the Confucian bureaucrats of the old monarchy, and that those mandarins had no more efficient social vision for the future than to restore the old monarchical order, which means that their defeat was a foregone conclusion not only because they could not cope with the technological force of the French, but also because their alliance with the peasantry, her force was circumstantial and not enduring, that the peasantry would rally to them for short periods of time because they hated this French occupation, but that in terms of an enduring relationship, what did the mandarins have to offer to peasants who, after all, wanted a rearrangement of property in the villages. Now we know that in the decade before the First World War, Vietnamese nationalism shifted gears, and that we're talking then about the modernist current. We're talking about certain Vietnamese intellectuals and bourgeois merchants who are investigating the reasons for Vietnam's defeat and who, upon contemplation, finally conclude that the elite in Vietnam, the intellectuals in Vietnam, must open themselves to Western technology and Western science, who become the harbingers of an intellectual revolution which they believe will ultimately modernize the country and open it to capitalist development. Now, their inspiration in the first instance were the Chinese reformers at the end of the 19th century. Because, you know, in that decade of the 1890s in China, there was a tremendous crisis of conscience. China had lost the war to Japan in 1894 and 5, and again was to suffer at the hands of Western imperialists in 98 and 99, when leaseholds and spheres of influence were carved out of Chinese sovereignty. And so a phalanx of reformers emerged from the court itself and among the mandarins who said that China, after all, had to reform her state structure and that she had to bury part, at least, of the reactionary Confucian ideology. But even more, it was Japan that inspired these modernists in Vietnam. And you can understand that. Japan, after all, was a tremendous inspiration all over the Far East at the turn of the 20th century. Here was a country which from 1868, from the so-called Meiji or the Enlightenment, emerged from a feudal isolation and within 30 years became a modern industrial country that was able to defeat China in the mid-1890s, and even more, that was able to defeat Russia in 1904 and 5 in the Russo-Japanese War, thus showing that yellow people are not inferior, 
wanted to its knees a European power. And so it was Japan that was looked upon as the great model. And so it was one boy, Shaw, who became the first of these modernists to go off to Japan. And he, after all, in many instances, an important and heroic patriot in Vietnam. And it was Shaw that went off to Tokyo in 1905. And when he left that city, he came away with two conclusions. One, that there was something magnificent about the application of Western technology and science that enabled a country like Japan to become so very modern and so very industrialized. And second, the conclusion that Japanese imperialism, as it seemed so very evident, really had a liberating core to it. That Japan was not so interested in conquering other countries as in driving Western imperialism out of Asia. And so Fong Boy Chao went back to Vietnam with two assumptions. One, that the modernization of Vietnam would come by a revolution from the top as it had come in Japan that what it required was a modernizing monarchy, as the Meiji had been a modernizing monarchy. And secondly, that that required the armed insurrection against the French presence. It meant the French had to be driven out in order to get that modernizing monarchy into motion. And that meant in Zhao's position, because he was bourgeois, because he had no links to the mass, it meant that small conspiratorial societies would trigger a revolt against the uh, French presence, and then Japan would come in to help. Now the disenchantment over that was very rapid, as you can imagine. Japan was in no way interested in helping Vietnam liberate herself from France. And consequently, in 1907, on the 10th of July, Japan signed a treaty with France. She needed money after the Russo-Japanese War. France granted her a loan of 300 million francs, in return for which Japan promised that she would observe all of the positions that France had in Asia. Uh, that she would in no way undermine a French imperialism in Asia. And so Fong Boy Zhao and that modernist group are left high and dry until the Chinese Revolution of 1911 and 12. Because that momentarily brings Dr. Sun Yat-sen to the presidency of the Chinese Republic. And so the strategy of Zhao remains the same, but the terms change. This time, the instrument of modernization will not be the reforming monarchy, but the democratic republic. And this time, the intervening outside power will not be Japan, but it will be the Republic of China, that poor republic in which Sun Yat-sen had all the trouble he could have in order to make the warlords in any way agree that he was the president of a republic. And so we see the pitiful futility of that modernizing current uh, before the First World War. We see, for example, what a false premise it is based upon, that it was possible to create an elite with Western science and technology. Where in hell the educational system for that would the French ever admit it? Now you know perfectly well that if there's anything that panics imperialistic roar, it is education. They try to use it, after all, in order to create loyal servants. But always they watch those schools, always they watch those universities, and at the first sign that they become the incubus of patriotism or of insurrection, then they are closed down. And I saw that so very well, you know, in going around the world for those two years, in 63 and 64, when I had that very cool job with UNESCO, 
and they sent me for two years to write some damnable history of civilization or something, <laughs> with three other people to hold pencils also. <laughs> and we went round and visited these 18 countries and settled in. And for me, it was terrific, because who could ever have afforded to do that? And consequently, I went to these places, and we had among the four of us this division of labor. And since I was considered to be the great esophagus, I did the lectures. <laughs> <laughs> what I had to do was in every one of the 18 countries we visited to lecture in what was called the National University of the country. Now, I assure you that that covers a multitude of dumps. And consequently, you go into a country, for example, like Jordan, and they had no university, national university. They set up the lecture in a bar. They lectured on top of the bar and so forth. And so he went. But wherever I went, needless to say, going in the hole to these various places, I carried around a rotation of six lectures with me and just spotted them as I went in, never understanding whether there might be a real and very vital point. And I went into place after place, in Tehran, for example, where the students immediately surrounded me outside the building to show me the bullet holes where their comrades had been shot down by the Iranian army because they'd gotten out of hand. But I remember going into Istanbul and lecturing in the National University there. And in the rotation, it came out that I was lecturing on the legacy of the European Enlightenment. But lots of good stuff, you see, about Voltaire and defending to his death and so forth. And all sorts of things about the Collis affair and all of this anti-repressionism of the philosophe. And so I made my lecture. I made it about four times before. It wasn't so sensational, frankly. And there was this absolutely thunderous applause. Well, I thought, you know, I mean, they have no standards here. <laughs> <laughs> was, which I had to know, that the university had just been open for two days after four days of having been closed down, or uh, four months of having been closed down, and why? Uh, because the students had begun a forum series that in a sense began to point out some of the contradictions in Turkish society, and that simply didn't go. And I come in and I'm talking about both half saying, go do it, and speak, and so forth. And so on, and needless to say, there was a certain fertilization. But it suffices to say that all of that became very apparent to me, uh, that as much as we denigrate uh, the universities and the schools, and as much as we think, for example, that they are, which they surely are, establishment institutions and the like, you get in certain conjunctural situations where there's no other platform and no other place, and consequently they become explosive. So then look at what happened in Vietnam with the so-called free school of Hong Kong. That free school had been established with Vietnamese capital. It was private Vietnamese that opened that school in 1907 and enrolled about a thousand young men and women uh, to study moderate science, to study technology, especially to study a little of their history and not to grow up as those Maghrebians, those North Africans had to grow up under French rule, saying every morning that they blessed their common ancestor, Clovis and Charlemagne. And <laughs> obviously, they wanted to know something about that. And so it became a vessel. So it became an incubus of a certain patriotism. And the French permitted it to last for eight months and then suppressed it, shut it down, and arrested a two-thirds of its teachers. And when it happened uh, that the Anamite peasantry, uh, the peasantry of Anam, protested and went into an insurgent, almost near revolt, in the latter stages of 1908, against high taxes and against the slave labor on the plantations, again, the colonial administration decided it must be the schools, it must have been that free school of Tom King, and there were literally hundreds of arrests and several executions of this modernist bloc in uh, Vietnam. And you see, even if you take, because there's so much mythology about imperialism, like the idea of good imperialists, and consequently, if you take somebody like Albert Sado, 
uh, who was the Governor General of France in Vietnam twice, uh, between 1911 and 14, again between 1917 and 19, and Salon is a radical that is a member of the French Radical Party, considered to be a great friend of the Vietnamese. But a big block of Wasabo and his so-called educational reform uh, consisted of having expanded the number of these in the entire country to six. Three for the French, three for the French and the Vietnamese together. And then, uh, for having opened in April of 1917, uh, the so-called University of Hanoi, uh, which was opened simply to recruit lower bureaucrats from the Vietnamese to do low-paid jobs, such an inferior institution uh, that no Vietnamese could have become an engineer or a doctor, something to help his people. But worse than that, because in the final analysis, and I don't denigrate the heroism of somebody like Thon Boy Zhao, who after all fought for the freedom of his country, but these are bourgeois, and they are isolated, and they do not have anything by way of a program for the masses. What will a capitalism in some distant future mean to the Vietnamese masses? And what do they mean uh, by China or by Japan coming in to liberate the Vietnamese? Can a people be liberated except by itself? Now you know that 1917 is a watershed. And consequently, in the post-war period, all through the Far East, <laughs> nationalism becomes a much more radical phenomenon. It is because of the Russian Revolution, which doesn't stay contained within Soviet borders. They are those Bolshevik leaders shouting to the toiling masses of the colonized world that they have but to organize and throw off their yoke. And so 1919, and someone had ought to have the splendid idea of writing a book just about 1919 in terms of that concatenation of riots, that concatenation of demonstrations, that kind of spirit of liberation sweeping from country to country. The Amritsar riots in India, the May 4th uprising in China, the rice riots in Japan, uh, the nationalist riots in Indonesia and in Burma. Uh, there's something of God in the third world and especially in Asia. In Vietnam, it holds on until about 1923 and forward. And if you want a symbolic date, the 10th of June of 1924, because then it was that a young Vietnamese revolutionary Somebody named Hawk, who was a cat who was an uh, emigre uh, in Canton, in the south of China, waited until that June of 1924 when the reactionary governor general of Vietnam, a man named Merlin, was coming on a visit and threw a bomb in order to kill him. Missed the governor general, didn't kill him, killed one of his aides, started to flee, began to be caught, jumped into a river and drowned himself. But a monument was put to this young revolutionary's memory. And in Canton, it became kind of a symbol for a renewed insurgency, a willingness to take up force, to take up arms. And we've seen it, you see, in terms of the collective action of workers in factories, in the mines, on the plantations, all that begins around 24 and five. And then the students in 1926, with all of those strikes in their schools and these settings, leading finally to the expulsion of a thousand students. But, the French administration makes a deaf ear. It does not hear. Critically important to understand the preemption of Vietnamese communism. 
because the colonial administration in Indochina, and especially in Vietnam, turns a deaf ear to the most moderate entreaties. The entreaties of those who don't want to throw the French out, who don't want to have independence and certainly not a social revolution. I'm talking about that liberal wing of the landlord class, of those that grew wealthy under the French wing, and who organized the so-called Constitutionalist Party in 1923. And they organized that party in the words of Jean himself, who was the founder of it. They organized that party so that the struggle in Vietnam will not get too radical. And all they ask for is some participation in the running politically of the state of Vietnam. What they ask for is that there be more pumps in the upper bureaucracy for Vietnamese that Vietnamese bureaucrats be treated with the same regard, that there be a little more freedom of the press. And the French refuse, and they don't listen, and they prefer repression. And with these guys, they don't have to worry, because with comfort there is no problem. With those who hang on to the coattails of imperialism, they cannot face the possibility of a revolutionary independence. And so it was that in the spring of 1930, that critical moment in the development of Vietnamese revolutionary currents, in the spring of 1930 when there was such an insurrection by the peasantry of Annam that it ended in Soviets being founded, then in Nanking, in Cochin, China, which was in the very center of the large estate area, there came together those landlords to agree that they would help the French state, that they would help French imperialism uh, to crush this movement of the peasantry. And they met on the 6th of June of 1930 uh, with the Governor General Pasquier. And they said, uh, you can depend upon us in the movement uh, to crush the communists. And certainly their press showed it. And in the so-called Colonial Council, uh, that focus advisory group in which these landlords sat, presumably to advise to the Governor General uh, what they proposed uh, was the use of chemical warfare against uh, the insurgent uh, peasantry. No. Uh, they cut themselves off. Uh, the assimilationists are uh, the ones that wanted to associate. Uh, they cut themselves off uh, from the liberation movement. Uh, they are the enemy. And the French colonial administration had played at reforms, but to play for time, what we today call the Rhodesian game. <laughs> and so it is, for example, that in 1932, after a terrific year of red uprising in 1930, and a year of white terror in 31, that outdid anything the French had imposed in Vietnam, so in 1932, there was terrific uproar, even in metropolitan France, by good-spirited men and women, saying that France had become barbarous, that it had become wholly uncivilized in its repression, and the colonial administration on the spot, no, it would do a bit of front reforming. <laughs> So it brought back the young emperor. The young emperor had been out for 10 years. He was a boy and sent to France to do his school. His name was Bao Dai. And Bao Dai had been 10 years in France from 22 to 20 to 32. He came back at the age of 21, something of a playboy. The French brought him back with the idea that he uh, could reform the regime and uh, make it a bit more constitutional. And Bao Dai chose a Catholic Mandarin uh, to be the head of his reforming commission, named Ingo Din Diem. 
And that same GM, uh, who will appear in the 1950s, takes on that mission. Well, six months pass, and every minor reform that GM and Baudai propose uh, to make a constitutional monarchy, uh, to get the participation of the Vietnamese, is opposed uh, by the French colonial administration until GM resigns and Baudai goes off to his hunting, his yachting, and less mentionable places. <laughs> and so the question, but where is the Vietnamese woman top? Where is the bourgeois nationalist movement? It comes almost everywhere, and yet you see Paul Reynaud, who we know as conservative, even reactionary, who is minister of colonies in 1931 in the Laval government, who goes out to Vietnam on a fact-finding mission, wanting to know why all of those riots had occurred in 1930, why the peasantry was so impudated to communism, and Reynaud said, when he got back to France, something that showed his high intelligence at any rate, because essentially, <laughs> essentially he put his finger on that lacuna. And he said, behind a thin curtain of intellectuals, in the area where in Europe there is a middle class, you have in Vietnam a backyard. Aside from the landowners, whom we have created with our policy of increased rice aid, rice aid grid, and aside from a few people owning enterprises connected with our public works, and a few rare men engaged in commerce, there is no middle class, nothing which could be the backbone of a reform movement immune from communism. What Reynaud didn't say was that the French did that, that they systematically deindustrialized Vietnam, that they systematically uh, prevented a native capitalism from developing, that what they did was to show to the Vietnamese masses the very first model of capitalism, foreign old, exploitative, and show them no promise out of a system of that kind at all. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a middle class nationalist party because the Vietnam Nationalist Party was founded in 1927, but by a different strata of the bourgeoisie, by a petty bourgeoisie, by those who are teachers, students, lawyers, doctors, minor functionaries, journalists, and they have no interest in establishing capitalism. They have interest only in establishing something vague that they call a democratic republic. And they have the courage and the militancy to want to overthrow the French position in Vietnam by force and violence, which they consider the only thing possible. And so we're talking about the VNQDD, going by those five initials, the Vietnamese Nationalist Party, the VNQDD. And there's something fascinating about it. Because you see, with the collapse of that party, the space is empty and there is nothing to fill it but communism. And that party was a party of young. And it was a party who believed in the Kuomintang in China. But that Kuomintang in China, after all, by 1927, had gone anti-communist. And that had infected also the young nationalists in the Vietnamese, a nationalist party. And they had no real ties with the masses. Their belief was, yes, an insurrection against the French but not by catalyzing workers into strikes, not by catalyzing a mass movement of peasants, but rather by seeding the army. In other words, to convert certain of the soldiers conscripted into the French force in Vietnam to nationalism and to get enough of them in the barracks so that they could take over those barracks, seize their officers, 
sees the city in which the barracks existed, finally destroy the provincial administration of the French, take over on a Vietnam-wide basis the country. A naive gesture. Young, the leader, 23 years old, playing around a little too obviously with their theories, seated with police spies, making bombs every once in a while that went off before they were supposed to and hence attracting the police, arrests galore, and then desperation. The 9th of February of 1929, they assassinated that Bazaar. Terrible creature, that Bazin, the one who had been the recruiter of labor for those plantations, for the rubber plantations, bumped off, and after that, the French state, a veritable reign of terror against these nationalists, desperate, from the defensive, they had to do something, it would be the uprising. And the uprising would come in February of 1930, and it would center around the military outpost of Yen Bay. And Yen Bay became the key to the whole operation, because the plan was that there should be a simultaneous uprising among the troops loyal to this nationalist cause in all of the barracks that Yen Bay should be seized, which was the key to what was called the Upper Delta, which meant that at the frontier of China, uh, where there were nationalists who were favorable to this rising, there would be simply an open plain in which nationalists could invade and consequently join up with these troops. And so the 10th of February of 1930, people badly organized, not coordinated, at one in the morning, uh, the young insurgents in the Yen Bay barracks seized it, raised the red flag, flew it, took the city of Yen Bay, and nothing much else moved. And when it did, it was mowed down. And it was a terrible defeat. And in the wake of it, all of the soldiers who had participated were executed. And some 80 leaders of the Vietnamese Nationalist Party were arrested. And finally, the leader, plus 12 of his cohorts, were executed on the 17th of June of 1930. And they died by the guillotine. And magnificently, two yards before they got to the guillotine, they stopped, and in full courtyard, and with huge shriek, shouted, Vietnam, Vietnam. And they left that legacy, but a shattered party, and a party that lived only as a ghost in southern China until the liberation of Vietnam from the Japanese in 1945, and a few of them straggled back. But that is critical, because the space is open, simultaneous with Yen Bay, comes the formation of the Indo-Chinese Communist Party in January of 1930. And so the balance shifts, the baton passes from bourgeois nationalists to revolutionary communists. But at the same time, at the very foundation officially of a party whose militants existed before the party did, there comes a reorientation of the strategy of Vietnamese communism. And it is critical to our understanding of what happens later. Because from the beginning in 1930, the shift went from a class alliance strategy of all nationalist groups against French imperialism to the strategy of class struggle, pure and simple. Or to put it in its bluntest terms, it meant that for almost 10 years, from 1930, really until the founding of the Viet Minh in May of 1941 by Ho Chi Minh, for that decade, Nguyen Ong Kok, or Ho Chi Minh, was not 
in the leadership of the Vietnamese Communist Party, and on the contrary, fairly much in the doghouse. Now, you know, Ho Chi Minh doesn't have to yield to anybody in the Vietnamese spectrum in terms of credentials as an authentic revolutionary. And certainly he doesn't have to yield in terms of understanding what the class struggle is. But interesting that before he took the name Ho Chi Minh, he took the name Nguyen I Koch, which was not his name either. He had 14 names in his office. <laughs> and consequently, Nguyen I Koch, which he kept for a long while, means in Vietnamese, John the Patriot. And so there is something fascinating about the implication that the way to the socialist revolution lies through the recreation of the nation. That the way to the Vietnamese revolution lies through the patriotism of the people who in their struggle to restore the nation will themselves become transformed, radicalized, prepared for socialism. Now let's not underestimate that fantastic revolutionary agyrum of Ho Chi Minh. Remember that coming as he did of a Mandarin family in Indochina, in Vietnam, that he left his country at the age of 21 in 1911 and didn't return to it for three decades that he went in a tremendous search for revolutionary method and revolutionary contact. That he lived a bit in America, lived a bit in England, finally landed in 1919 in France, and there settled in a little pad in the 17th arrondissement with two other Vietnamese. It's still there, number nine, and pas comfort. And there, in that circumstance, he began those contacts with the revolutionary syndicalists, with the socialists, then radicalized under the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution. Finally, yet, he joins the Socialist Party of France and shows up at the Congress of Tours in December of 1920, the Congress at which the Communist Party was founded by a schism and consequently opts for the Third International for Bolshevism. Of course, he's a communist and always was. And consequently, what he is interested in is really an alliance of colonized people. There in 1921 is Ho Chi Minh uh, forming uh, that intercolonial union, uh, which is a union of communist militants uh, from all the different colonies of France uh, to make a common offensive against France. And then in his newspaper, Pariah, he writes not only of Vietnam, but he writes certainly of all of the oppressed of colonial people. Goes off to Moscow in June of 1923 in order to go to the university for Eastern workers. In other words, for toiling revolutionaries of the Orient. And there learns about the structure of a revolutionary party. Goes to China in 1925 in January, and there participates in the reconversion of the woman Dong into a revolutionary instrument uh, by the alliance between Sun Yat-sen and the Soviet Union. But it's in, it's in Canton that he meets other really tough revolutionaries uh, from Vietnam. And together, he and five other comrades found the Tan Nien, the Association of Revolutionary Vietnamese Youth. And the Tan Nien becomes really the incubus of Vietnamese communism. It is its first organization. And what happens is that between 1925 and 7, there are a certain number of cadres who are formed by the Tan Nien. And between 27 and 29, about 250 are sent back into Vietnam. 
and there they convert about a thousand others. And there they begin to form cells among the workers in the factory, among the peasants on the plantations, among students. And they begin to encourage not only ideological discussion, but practice, practice, move, move, protest, organize. But you know that Kandak became inhospitable after April of 1927 because Chiang Kai-shek got paid off, we know, and consequently went to the Western side and against, really, the anti-imperialist movement, broke with the Chinese communists. And so uh, the Vietnamese militants who were, uh, uh, who were billeted in Canton lived on borrowed time. Uh, by December of 1928, uh, they were driven out of the country. Uh, they went to Hong Kong. And then, in the middle of 1929, in June, they held the first Congress of Tom Nguyen. And that's interesting, because there was a conflict. And Ho Chi Minh presented a program. And the program he presented was democratic, reformist, in a way, it was a program of transition. It would lead ultimately to socialism, but not at once. What he is saying in effect is, go close to the mass. Learn what their grievances are. Fertilize those grievances. Let them fight for what is immediate in their eyes. And so there are points like replace indirect taxes with an income tax on the rich. Points like expropriate land over 100 hectares. Uh, so there are points like expropriate all foreign-owned factories. Anti-imperialist, but it doesn't destroy little property. You see what is in Poe's mind? The national liberation struggle first, the social revolution as its consequence. But there was a split, and some walked out and said we must have a communist party at once, and we must have it based upon class against class, not with any alliances with the bourgeoisie. And that party was founded in January of 1930, and for a decade, the strategy of Ho Chi Minh, of those strategic alliances to mobilize the nation around the revolutionary implications of patriotism, which you cannot conceive of in the West, but which you can conceive of in a country like Vietnam, that goes by abeyance until Ho organizes the Viet Minh in May of 1941. Because you see that there was a conjuncture in 1930. First, there was the example of the Roman God and the fact that you really couldn't trust these bourgeois nationalists, that they would break with the revolution. Secondly, there was the Sixth Congress of the Communist International, held in 1928. And you know Stalin, who had been long in the business of selling out the revolution, suddenly decided that it was a time when capitalism was on its tender. Now, 1928 wasn't such a date. But the Sixth Congress said that now capitalism is on the uh, defensive, that there must be an offensive, class against class. That was the motto. For colonial countries, it meant no alliances with the bourgeoisie. It meant, principally, no national liberation fronts. What it meant was mobilize workers especially, but workers and peasants in a direct frontal struggle against the class enemy. And that became, in Vietnam, the reason that the party is called, at the beginning, the Indo-Chinese Communist Party, and not the Vietnamese Communist Party. The Indo-Chinese option meant that the communists were to ignore the national reality, that they were to fight side by side in that artificial geographic unit that the French had made called Indochina, which grouped together Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos, that they were to fight side by side with those with whom they had real cultural differences and war 
historic grievances, and that they were to fight the same enemy as the French communists and hope that the French communists would overthrow that enemy on the other end. Whereas the Vietnamese option, the one of Ho Chi Minh, was the idea that the nation is an historic reality, that it touches people deeply, that in fighting for it, they will fight for its best conditions that they can be transformed. And so it was that in years like 32 to 35, the communist press is very critical of Ho Chi Minh is very critical of this guy's office. I just think they fought 45 years. <laughs> we owe them that. And so it was that Ho Chi Minh and the party press criticized from time to time as a petty bourgeois opportunist, having, having fallen into the trap of all of this uh, patriotism and so forth. But the third fact is the conjuncture itself. That the depression hit, that it covers Vietnam, that the peasants and the workers were literally torn to shreds. It's the worst period imaginable for the Vietnamese masses. And the party, with its line of class against class, can do a lot. And I can't tell you what happened in the 30s. It was a veritable explosion. The party led in the, among the Anamite peasant, half starving. You see the price of rice on the world market, the price of rubber and coal, all of them had gone down and who suffered, of course, those who were the wage earners, those who got a pittance from the grain merchants. And consequently, in Anam, where they were half starving, yeah, of course, they went toward communism. And the communist party led something that was phenomenal. It was the red year. The call in Anam, in central Vietnam, there were these demonstrations, there were these mobilizations, there, was these, there were these confrontations before the provincial headquarters of the French presence. And in all, in three provinces of central Vietnam, the peasantry overthrew the French administration and established what lasted for six months, Soviets. And they established land sharing, and they divided the land. And they established revolutionary tribunals, and they pumped off a good number of mandarins and very reactionary landlords, until, of course, repressed by superior force. And the same true in Cochin, China, where you get 1,300 coolies in February of 1930 on the Michelin estate, going into a tremendous rampage and seizing the estate. And all of that gets repressed in a terror that is so bad that in the Petit Pomila de Tonkin, which is itself a Cologne newspaper, a Cologne or a colonist writes on the 15th of March of 1931, the behavior of the French troops, and in particular of the foreign legion, is one of odious brutality and unchanged uh, un soldiery, free to indulge all of their instincts and terrorize the entire country. They steal, they rape, they burn, they execute, they do as they please. We are ruled by a horde of pirates in uniform set loose upon the country. Well, you know, that that means the destruction of the nationalist movement, the destruction of the cadre of the Communist Party, but it's got my love. And it is cut and decimated, and from Moscow, from the University of Toiling Workers of the Orient, are sent 40, 50 new Vietnamese to take the place, to replace the cadre at the top. There are outside centers in Siam, in the Northwest, in China, right on the frontier, in Paris itself. The party survives, does the incredible thing of making a close working alliance, the only one I know anything about, that lasts for four years, a close working alliance with the Vietnamese Trotskyists, 
<laughs> around the newspaper La Lutte struggle because in their class against class lie, they appeal to the Trotskyists. The communists much more susceptible to the peasantry than the Trotskyists, but together, over those years, they did something really to seed the communist party. It wasn't the proper tactic in the long run, inviting too much repression, but so much of that struggle of the mid-30s really stuck to the ribs. And then came the popular front in France. And what you do, what you do if you're a Vietnamese communist? Do you have French communists in the government in France? Do you want to overthrow it or do you wait for them to liberate you? What do you do? Oh, you wait long enough to find out that popular front by off. <laughs> that it is completely tied in with the colonial interest. It is doing nothing. Its reforms are derivative. And consequently, you go back to the question of struggle, but to struggle when the Japanese come on the scene and begin to occupy your country, you do lie with the kind of freedom that even the French colonial administration admitted, or do you have to say that your organization isn't the Communist Party, but a Vietnamese, a league for independence that will rally everyone to struggle. That's what Ho Chi Minh thought. That's what he did in May of 1941 with incredible Incredible, right?